So welcome to SME BizHub, the leading integrated digital SME content platform that aggregates all national SME related information by all stakeholders to enable SMEs as well as uh, the different ent entrepreneurship stakeholders make informed decisions. SME BizHub is a policy discourse platform where we unpack and examine current SME policies as well as discuss SME policy options based on current uh, felt challenges of SMEs and startups in Kenya. Um, today we are going to explore the policy landscape of the agricultural sector a bit broadly but with a special focus on small-scale farmers and attempt to uh, you know, provide policy options in response to the current uh, challenges faced. For starters, we'll attempt to identify key challenges facing the agricultural sector, especially for the small-scale farmers generally. Even as we do this, uh, we recognize that you know, agriculture is very broad and there are sub, uh, subsector specific challenges that exist that we'll not be able to tackle at least for this episode. Secondly, we'll paint a picture of the current, uh, of the current policy top, uh, topography, identify gaps that are there based on current challenges faced by small-scale farmers, as well as propose policy or interventions that can address these challenges. Finally, we'll explore how the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement will affect small-scale farmers and what different stakeholders, including farmers themselves, can do to, you know, take full advantage of the dispensation that kicked off in January 2021. To help us unpack this is Mr. Mushiri Nyaga, who serves as the executive director at the Local Development Research Institute. He previously served as the deputy executive director and policy lead at the Open Institute and worked on open data and open government projects at national and sub-national levels. Welcome to the program, Mr. Mushiri. Uh, thank you very much, Victor. Delighted to be here. Yeah, so to start us off, as a policy industry practitioner, you know, how important is the agricultural sector to Kenya and, uh, you know, what role do small-scale farmers play in the, you know, in, this, in the sector generally? Uh, the, the agriculture sector is, in many ways, literally the backbone. Um, of of uh, of the country's economy, your uh, you know so even even when you start thinking about agriculture as a sector, manufacturing as a sector, ICT as a sector, um, agriculture as a whole um, has a footprint across those other places. So even if you were to unbundle manufacturing and see what is the extent of agro processing, uh, you find agro processing. Um, it takes up a significant percentage of of, uh, of agriculture, and that is at the at the top end of uh, of the sector. And by top end, here I'm thinking about more of the sophistication uh, along the value chain. Um, uh, downstream uh, farm labor, agriculture labor, agriculture sector labor constitutes the largest percentage. I'm not sure what the what the what the census the data is right now. I haven't looked at that specific piece, but. Um, you know, all other data continues to show that uh, it, the sector is still the largest employer, and not just in Kenya, across um, across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, as an as a source of employment, uh, as as the main source of food uh, for what we still have as a predominantly uh, rural population, although it is very rapidly urbanizing. Um, if you are if you are to take or you, if you are to downgrade. Uh, the performance of the agriculture sector, it would affect food security, nutrition security, it would affect national security, instability, food prices would go up, plus the economy goes down, manufacturing reduces. Um, all these things end up be, being affected. And that is why I, 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 over the years, I, I began to really appreciate what we had in the 80s, you know, and, and maybe I don't know the 70s, I wasn't <laughs> paying attention, I was too little. <laughs> 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 that agriculture. It's the backbone of our sector. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> even as, as, as you say that, uh, sorry for cutting you short, um, I think maybe um, as you ad address that is also, maybe you can also pick up uh, challenges, you know, that the, fact, uh, the, that the sector faces. Uh, of course, they are very important, but we still continue to struggle as a country. So, and of course, this um, means that, you know, the, you know your farm level um, individual is, is struggling as a, as a uh, you know, as a small scale farmer. Yeah, no, in so at, at lo local development research institute, one of the work, one of our areas of work is uh, supporting extension in in uh, in in, uh, in the county level in Kenya. 
it's our, our initial program is Kenya focused. Um, it's called the Extension Support Program. And with the program we're working with the uh, county governments uh, to support the efforts to extend reach of extension services. Um, because, and this is probably w- w- the first challenge I'll, I'll put out there. And this is a challenge that's not just in Kenya. And ex- actually, probably in Kenya we do a little better compared to other, p- other, other parts of Africa. Um, in some parts of Kenya, you have an extension officer to farm a ratio of something like one to 3,000. Uh, that's really, really high. Uh, if you were to ask, you know, how many times over a period of three years, um, you know, a, 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 an extension officer will, will be able to reach a farmer and then see, you know, how many farmers then will they have reached over three years. You still have a lot of, you know, probably in the thousands, uh, uh, farmers who are who are not reached by extension services. So, extension, the state of extension, is a big, big um, area that uh, it remains a, a challenge because yeah. of funding, remains a challenge because of uh, human resource um, in the in the in the in the sector, and it, it be, and, and it's also a challenge because of the regulation, regulatory state yeah. of extension and advisory, uh, agricultural advisory in in, in the country uh, because there's a there's a vacuum mm. there um, as well. Uh, even as, you, as you're mentioning that, the question that maybe that is coming to my mind is um, how how is the extension services um, correlated with, uh, for instance, uh, productivity? So yeah, so like you're saying, we have a very high ratio between fa- uh, between a farmer and uh, you know extension officers. So the question is, how important is that to you know to the farmer? It's very important uh, in a number of areas. So one. So just l- think about what does, what is needed at the level of the farm for a farmer to achieve better outcomes. Um, so first, you need the right inputs. So information on the right inputs, um, you know, and and how to get them and how to use them, uh, is is one of the uh, uh, primary activities, primary uh, services that extension provides. Um, and the second is uh, good agronomic prat- practices, um, uh, whether whether it's animal husbandry, crop husbandry, fisheries, etc. The right practices yeah. will have an impact on productivity. Um, the the source outside of of uh, academia and going to school and getting a diploma in agriculture or uh, you know or something related to that extension is your source of that information, right? So th- those. Those two pieces there, you know, your access to the right inputs, access to the right information on agricultural practices, those come f- primarily through the extension window. Uh, the other places, of course, farmers get that is from peers, but unfortunately, uh, some of that includes within it an untested, uh, um, yeah, not working kind of <laughs> information, yeah. um, a lot of myths uh, that that end up, uh, you know, that uh, you know, for end up being being uh, propagated. Yeah. Uh, that affect productivity and and sometimes you know people don't know because they were they were, they were doing two bags of maize for instance from the small plot uh, their peer farmer tells them to to try this this hack and they move from two bags to three bags and they they're very happy about it not knowing they're supposed to be doing twelve bags <laughs> yeah for the same piece yes if they had the right information yeah um, so th- extension is really at the core of of um, uh, in addition, of course, to the other factors of production, mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. at the core of agricultural productivity. Yeah. So, um, um, and uh, even as we roll, uh, as we roll on to the next question, you know, um, um, you still maybe haven't uh, highlighted other challenges other than the extension services. But even as maybe you touch on that, um, could you maybe paint for us a picture of the state of play in terms of uh, you know the policy, um, topography in the country? You know, because that's that's what really supports. Uh, or gives the foundation for uh, you know support to to farmers in Kenya. So you, you see that uh, over the years we've paid a lot of attention to uh, the parts of the agriculture sector that we uh, that are very visible in our calculations of our GDP. Uh, so you'll see um, a number of policy interventions that uh, you know speak to those uh, specific areas. I'm thinking, for, uh, for instance, cash crops. Your coffee, your your tea. Uh, we've just we've just now got a new t- piece of legislation on tea, for instance, that revital- returns and revitalizes the tea board, um, and tries to address the issue of of the Kenya Tea Development Authority 
uh, and how how they manage farmer money, right? Yeah. Uh, among other things, but uh, th- that you'll find that the tea sector, uh, you know, has a very strong regulatory uh, framework. Mm-hmm. is very organized, um, and uh, and it's, and has very strong linkages from farm to export markets. Yeah. Uh, to a certain extent, you see the same thing with coffee, um, and there should be um, uh, s- some similar piece of legislation now beginning to make its way uh, to help the coffee sector as well, because the coffee sector has had a huge problem with with uh, with, with uh, um, uh, predatory middlemen. Yeah. Um, the the the, 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 the d- we've had politicians who've tried to fight this for uh, for decades, but they they're, they're very strong. As some would describe cartels. <laughs> uh, that have that have you know made that made that a very difficult fight for many of these guys. So uh, these pieces kind of show you where there has been a lot of attention uh, on addressing the policy. Le- these are highly political, um, high net worth um, areas, and it's it's not a surprise then that they would end up being being so regulated. You don't see the same thing, for instance, with maize. Um, yeah. But then again, you don't want some some things regulated and overregulated because it affects access. Yeah. Uh, but at the level of food security, now you have your strategic food reserve. Um, it plays a big part um, in how we move money around, in how we af- affect the price of a bag of maize. Consequently, how much a packet of flour costs. Consequently, how many families will be able to put ugali on the table um, at the same level they were doing a year ago or two years ago, etc. Um, you have policy areas that are still um, not quite addressed. Things like uh, ar- areas that affect, that address land management and sustainable land management. Um, there's still po- uh, policy and legislative gaps there. We, we are yet to, to, to properly to put in place a revised um, uh, uh, legislation, uh, regulations on extension. So agriculture extension right now is, is a wild west. Mm-hmm. Uh, the private sector, Non-profit sector. Anybody can go in there and provide any kind of advice to farmers, um, yeah. and and that is a dangerous thing because, like I said before, you'd have all these incorrect pieces of information making their way, affecting practices, affecting outcomes, and that eventually affecting food and nutrition security even at the household level. So that is um, another area. So you have areas of policy it at the input side. We're thinking about seeds, which is a very, very well regulated space. Um, fertilizer, not as strictly regulated. Uh, and then extension, which is, you know, right now up in the air. There are guidelines, but right. I don't think we have, you know, uh, revised r- regulations yet. Uh, then you have your uh, your output side, mm-hmm. in, in terms of how things are traded. Yeah. Uh, so seed trade, um, you, you know, uh, dairy, uh, there's, 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 uh, there's an effort there that criminalizes, uh, uh, you know, s- sale, of, uh, sale of raw milk. Yeah. Which, which you know, if you think back to our to our rural areas, you know, that's how our our, 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 our relatives, you know, grandmothers, etc., yeah. yeah. uh, b- you know, are able to make a little money on the side, yeah. you know, get some some inputs from selling uh, that extra milk to their neighbor um, a- across the way. Uh, so there are, there are certain verticals, certain areas where the uh, policy and regu- le- regulatory framework is very very strong, and there are others where for because it's not as organized, because the incentives are not quite there in place, or because it's such a hot potato, nobody wants to touch it just yet. Yeah, they have been kind of left alone. So, like you said earlier, the agriculture sector is very big, yeah. very wide, uh, lots of specialities and subspecialties within within it, and you see this also now playing out um, on on this on this end as well. Um, and and there's a big macro area as well, which we, we don't get to talk about as much, which is agricultural research. Yeah, right, because the context specific inputs. Mm. That make their way at the to the farm level. Um, some of th- some of those come from uh, uh, national agricultural research institutes. Yes. Uh, if uh, agricultural research is left to be predominantly uh, 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 the the space for the pr- for the private sector, private sector yeah. then the kind of inputs that and and and, and the v- uh, value chains that have national security, national food security implications, but are not very commercially viable would never get that kind yeah. of attention because agricultural research is extremely expensive. So going back and checking the extent to which the national government is funding our agricultural research institutes mm. uh, vis-a-vis funding from, from donors uh, should should tell us whether where we are most at risk. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, although investments had gone up uh, up until a few years ago, 
the vast the biggest part of the development budget for the uh, agricultural research institute was actually donor funded um, and these are things that should should worry us uh, the the way that the innovations come from the agricultural research institute and make their way into the private sector how the extent to which our agricultural research institutes are able to commercialize their innovations in ways that make sure that those innovations are accessible yeah. and affordable, and affordable. Um, is is uh, is I think an area that we still need to do a lot of work around. Um, Calro, uh, the, the maize varieties, because we were looking at maize the last, the last few years, they, they have some very good maize varieties that they have developed that are drought resistant, that are disease resistant, that are good productivity, that have good taste. That's something <laughs> a factor if you don't <laughs> like the taste of your maize. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but some of them are, are, are not making their way into the commercial space. Uh, so some of that I, you know, st tends to, to sit still on the, on the shelf. So until the Kenya seeds and the seed cores and the dry lands and the faidas and all these companies uh, strike those agri commercial agreements and move that that uh, that hybrid into the market, mm. um, you know, until that is done, then this remains uh, uh, inaccessible to, to us. So I think maybe there are still areas where we need to crack the nut yeah. for how do we take these innovations that work for us and put them in the market in a way that allows them to compete with the Monsantos yeah. and, and, and the other, um, you know, overseas brands. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's deep and, and it's very interesting. You know, um, even as we close, um, you know, we've had the, you know, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, you know, um, uh, coming into effect uh, January. I think uh, there are concerns that, you know, um, African countries are not ready for it. You know, they, we, don't, we don't have the you know subnational or even national level um, um, practices or legislation that can be able to uh, you know effectively enable countries to trade with each other. You know, I, I know it's 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 a broad, I know it's a, it's 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 broad, and I know it's, uh, it's still you know it's still early days. Uh, but um, you know, the question that maybe I would want to ask is how can you know your typical farmers and you know the different stakeholders. Um, work uh, to ensure that you know uh, your your average farmer is able to you know access markets and is able to improve their practice. Now that's that's a very good question. Some of these um, initiatives, efforts that uh, get a lot of attention at the sub at the regional level, uh, can tend to seem like a very elitist opportunity that only is accessible to the to the few. Uh, the continental free trade area uh, is uh, is at at concept uh, is a fantastic idea, and it is really one of the core ways we will achieve our, our goal uh, to triple intra-African trade. Uh, if we can increase our and, and strengthen our intra-African trade, the continent becomes less uh, dependent on, uh, on on the on the global north and the west. Um, who, you know, in my view, have always had a very extractive relationship uh, w with us. So, having said that. Um, the challenge, uh, I think, for me, comes down now to uh, the level of the value chains. Uh, f f uh, for instance, you're going to find some value chains, like I said before, where they have a significant sophistication uh, that has been achieved um, that addresses a lot of intra-country trade, inter-country trade, um, and allows for uh, you know access to markets to be better defined. Um, and then, you know, like horticulture, for instance, you, you'll see that there's a very sophisticated export uh, regime that has quality assurance, um, you know, tracking to source, and all these things that, that people are worried about, especially in the West when they're buying from, from, uh, from African okay. countries. Some of that infrastructure becomes very useful when you're trading across borders with other African countries as well, because you answer some of the questions, those markets, which markets which are also becoming fairly sophisticated will be asking about the products and services that yeah. they are getting. So there's, in, in my view, there's, um, uh, there's there, there, there are going to be areas and value chains that have enough sophistication where we don't have to worry too much about whether there is existing legislation to, to, uh, to, to make uh, inter-country trade uh, uh, possible. Okay. There are others, of course, like maize, where th these are a staple that has food security implications. So you, you will find uh, countries that block exports um, for a certain time or during a certain season because they, they had a, p a poor harvest and they want to keep the supplies within the country 
Um, and, you know, I, I remember Malawi private sector being up in arms at some point because the ca- the country controlled the price and then locked the borders. <laughs> so, so despite the fact that you could get better prices yeah, outside, you had yeah. to stick in the country <laughs> with your, and, and and of course the, the large scale farmers uh, that was a that was a painful experience. Yeah. So the the uh, the value chains at the level at the level of the value chains, I think is where a lot of these uh, conversations are, are are happening. So with grains, for instance, uh, th- there there is uh, standards that have been put in place that have been co developed across countries, especially for the East African region to uh, address uh, the intra intra country trade um for that that has come a very long way because you have to deal with issues around aflatoxins and, yeah, yeah. and and stuff like that um so at th- that that's a bit more slow moving yeah um and i think as as we move on from here countries are going to be uh, identifying those particular pains in, in across value chains and putting in place value chain specific interventions to ad- to address them at the level of the smallholder now is where th- things will get a bit interesting yeah. because uh, a smallholder farmer um, doesn't have the skill to uh, necessarily sell direct to a, 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 a consumer in, ad- in another in country, another country yeah. um, especially for some of the um, more common va- uh, commodities that we are we are trading in the, the legumes the cereals etc that that's that's going to need better organization at the national level uh, we, our biggest opportunity is the work that we have done over the years yeah. in cooperatives. Yeah. As a continental leader on cooperatives, I think Kenya s- probably stands a very good chance to make sure that our smallholder farmers can access those markets. But it means our cooperatives in uh, interfacing with the outside world a bit better. It means our cooperatives are getting better organized and getting more professionalized in how they are being run. Yeah. Um, uh, we, uh, again, it's, this is value chain specific, yeah. uh, right? Uh, most of the cooperatives that will come to your mind, you will see, uh, you yeah. know, coffee cooperatives, yeah. tea yeah. cooperatives, you know, b- dairy. Um, it, it the, the 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 way that the cooperatives organize themselves and seek those markets, and the le- the extent to which our governments mm. um, market our sectors yeah. across other countries, I think, is going to be a key thing. Um, I think, to a certain extent, we may we may need to think about at the continental level. The the, the 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 equivalent of the an African equivalent of the uh, food expo, yeah, uh, you know uh, where where all these countries you know put their best foot forward, bring their best cooperatives, bring their best private sector actors into a a place where they can market and sell to each other, yeah, um, because that is how that smallholder will eventually end up putting yeah. their putting their produce uh, on a table in in Morocco. Um, or, n- or on a table in, in Guinea. Yeah. Uh, so I, th- I, th- I think the opportunity for me uh, lies lies there. Uh, but there is one other thing that we need to now think about more, 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 more critically. What are our priority value chains? Yeah. Uh, and why? Why have we prioritized this specific value chain? So you have food security value chains, which is fantastic, and that is, that is good. When it comes to our export markets for Africa, yeah. I think we need to go back to the drawing board. Yeah. And ask ourselves, you know, what, which products uh, are can do well here, yeah. uh, and and can be produced at an, at a competitive cost, and that have a market yeah. in a number of other African countries. Mm. Uh, there, there are, you know, we worked on a framework at some point, um, th- thinking about inter-African trade, um, and one of the things wha- wha- in that framework is likability. Yeah, so just think about. The, the concept of insects for food, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, if, if, if the insects have the highest protein per kilo of anything we have access to, higher protein than fish. Okay. You're looking at protein content of 65% for, okay. for something okay. like cricket, right? <laughs> and, and it's very, very affordable, way more affordable, a fraction of the cost of, yeah. of, of tilapia, yeah. right? But you have to get past the likability Okay, for yeah. for Kenya, if you tell people, I, I'm saying you cricket. There's a guy who are, who had done this innovation with cricket biscuits. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. The, the cultural it, it gets a cultural block, like yes. you know, completely. And yet, eating insects isn't unusual for us. I remember yeah. these ones that come out and the the, 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 yeah, the, the ants, the, the flying ants, yeah. and the white ants, whatever they're called. 
Um, as kids, guys, remember eating them. Yeah. Probably you might need to start with that before you go to cricket. <laughs> <laughs> no, but even those are di- very difficult to sell outside of that context where, they yeah. are, where it has rained and kids yeah. are running after them. <laughs> when people grow up, it's like they walk away from these things. Yeah. But if there's a way of turning that into uh, in improving the likability of that uh, of that of that of that commodity, yeah. quote unquote, um, you could end up putting it on a shelf and, and monetizing it. Yeah. But you have to get past the issue of likability. So if in West Africa they're doing really, really well, um, okay, in West Africa is a big market yeah. for for the great African snail, right? So snail farming is a very viable yeah. uh, commercial uh, effort. But the question, maybe because I think you're touching on issues around market intelligence, you know, and you know you're you're putting out information, and uh, you know, I'm just wondering how can we be able to systemic, systemically be able to, um, you know, get this market intelligence information um, and have that cascade to farm level where, you know, we can, you know, I, me as a typical non-farmer, can be able to, you know, look at these opportunities and start investing in such. Because uh, that's basically, I think, that's also a challenge that I'm seeing. Yeah, at, at the small scale level, for me, there, there, there are two things. One, if we have an aggregate of that content, yeah. um, or a way of incentivizing people to aggregate that content, uh, that would be the first step. Um, so, uh, I, you know, for instance, you know, uh, if you guys set up a hub, set up an online hub, and and people can go in there and, and see what are the what are the hot new commodities in in, in Central Africa right now where they you you're ticking off the boxes uh, p- people have a willingness to pay we had a, we have the ability to produce and there's an export uh, regime that makes it easy for us to move that product from here into that country um you know what the prices are etc cetera, etc cetera. that would be um, a good place to to be this is going beyond yeah. um uh, what's the price of beans in Machakos yeah, yeah, today, yeah, yeah, right? I, I agree um and i think that's 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 a fast level just being able to get that information i don't think we have uh, at least I haven't seen mm. anywhere right now that has that level of information across multiple value chains. This African Grain Council has has Ratin, which uh, shows you the prices of of those cereals in in other markets in the East African region, which is which is which is great. But um, it means I have to go to a different place if I have to find information on vegetables or snails yeah. um, or crickets and and, <laughs> co- and cockroaches. And who who would best place? Who would be best placed in terms of you know stakeholders? To start that conversation around aggregating, um, you know, market intelligence information, it, w- should this come from government or should this, uh, this come from private sector? Because we know, maybe at farm level, even uh, you know, at, uh, farmers can't be able to generate that kind of data. Yeah, that, and for me, that brings me to the second. The second, yeah. the first thing was, you know, having this information accessible. Um, the second, uh, the second thing is organizing ourselves in order to access those markets. Remember. For smallholder farmers, they're, they're smallholder for a reason. They don't have the resources yeah. um, to access, you know, bigger markets. So they're also very good targets for predatory middlemen. Yeah. Uh, and these intermediaries uh, tend to be the ones that uh, extract the most value from uh, from from those agricultural value chains. So having uh, a, a very deliberate, organized effort to target and enter specific uh, value chains. Yeah for me is 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 really really important and that f- that is where in my view the uh, information aggregation the moving that information fr- that information from information to intelligence yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right um requires a kind of partnerships that that make sure that the content is being produced my v- my view is this should predominantly be a, um a private sector led um effort it doesn't have to be that it's run by a mckinsey or the equivalent of a bloomberg uh, this is something I think could be done by the cooperative movement, for instance, organizing itself yeah. at the level of the cooperative movement, not necessarily organized by the Ministry of Cooperatives. Um, it could be something done by by uh, apex institutions like KEPSA, for instance. Um, you know, multiple actors, you know, national chamber, etc., coming together um, and and supporting the the existence of this kind of a platform. I think there are enough. There have been enough attempts and examples of, of this kind of approach, and I think it can work. Because member, member-based organizations tend to do this really, really yeah. well. Yeah. Um, 
but there are certain kinds of uh, areas where maybe the government would be um, best placed uh, to to play in, uh, and that's maybe because the, the incentives might not be as high for the private yeah. sector, uh, especially for new areas where they, there's little known information and the private sector is willing to, to take the risk. Um, but I th- that for me is where the 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 the, the opportunities lie. Having fast that information become available yeah. so that people can know. You don't have to eat the snails. Yeah, you just. But there's a market for them, yeah. and this is how you do them here. Um, and you end up, in my view, you could very well end up with one of the biggest snail farming cooperatives here, because they're exporting the product there. Yeah. Um, I, you know, they're extracting value from from this in a way that works for them, and that's because the, f- the information remains available. They know that the interest continues to persist. The prices continue to be competitive. Uh, their their efforts on the ground are going to pay off, you know, when they put their their, their produce out there. But it it has to come back down at the national sub national level yeah. to farmer organisations, um, and uh, that is really where we need to put our biggest uh, foot forward. Uh, no, our biggest effort in putting our foot forward. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I- you know, interesting conversation. Um, you know, I think uh, that's a perfect place to wrap uh, up this episode. I know, uh, you know, agriculture is is very broad, and we can, you know, we can discuss, uh, you know, different facets of it. But I hope the session has been helpful to all of you, um, and we invite suggestions uh, for topics that uh, you'd want us to tackle. And remember to subscribe to our channel SME Biz Hub, as well as follow us on social media. Thank you very much, and see you next time.